Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third in our series of webinars hosted as part of the ITEG project. ITEG is, uh, stands for Integrated Integrating Tidal Energy into the European Grid. It's a, a North, Interreg Northwest Europe funded project, collaborative project where clean hydrogen is a cornerstone topic. My name is Diana Rain. I'm from Smart Hydrogen Consulting. We're a consultancy working right across the hydrogen value chain, and we're, we are a project partner in the ITEG project. So I'm going to be moderating the session this morning. Um, it's entitled Sector Coupling and Scaling for Wide Scale Hydrogen Rollout. So just a, a couple of housekeeping points. I'm, I'm sure you're all uh, very familiar with Zoom, but um, just to confirm, Zoom has a chat function and a Q&A function. Um, please feel free to uh, introduce yourself and network in chat, and then um, please post questions in the Q&A uh, section. And we'll do our best to get through as many as we can in the session, and then we'll follow up. Uh, any that we don't cover today, we'll follow up with written answers. Uh, so the web webinar is being recorded, and the uh, recording will be made available after the event. So just in terms of setting the scene, um, there's, we all know there's tremendous potential, uh, tremendous momentum around uh, the potential for hydrogen at the moment, and its role in a decarbonised economy is being more and more recognised by governments and, and stakeholders alike. The topic of energy security has come to the fore, forefront in recent months, which has brought a further sense of urgency uh, to the need to transition from fossil fuels at rates at faster rates than I think we've um, previously envisaged. So the need is clearer than ever, but so are the challenges to overcome for hydrogen to reach its potential. So the, this morning we're going to hear about some ambitious initiatives which evaluate whole hydrogen ecosystems at different scales and consider how coupling supply and demand can help to drive down the cost of hydrogen. We're also going to look from the electrolyzer perspective on how that much needed cost reduction can be achieved. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker this morning, who is Mark Stollinger from the Port of Rotterdam. Mark is a chemical engineer who spent his early career in the industrial gas business working for air products, um, as did I. <laughs> he held various techno, econo, uh, techno commercial positions working in China and India as equipment sales director and JV board member. He returned to the Netherlands to work for Worley as country business manager. And last year, Mark moved his focus to large energy transition projects and joined the Port of Rotterdam authorities as business manager with a focus on hydrogen and infrastructure. So Mark, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, very happy that uh, I can uh, uh, speak to you all uh, today uh, from a distance and uh, happy to introduce to you some of the activities that we are taking in the uh, port of Rotterdam uh, to work towards a uh, carbon neutral uh, future. Um, so um, uh, really happy uh, that I can, uh, I can share this with you and if there are questions afterwards, uh, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to contact me. All right, um, next slide. Yeah, just to give you a very quick, broad overview uh, uh, on Rotterdam, uh, the port of Rotterdam. Um, everybody probably does know that Rotterdam is a very large port in Europe. Actually, it's the first and biggest port in, in, in Europe. Uh, however, uh, since uh, the last uh, 10, 20 years, there are lots of container ports that uh, that have have uh, surpassed uh, uh, Rotterdam on a an, on an world scale. However, uh, what people probably don't res uh, uh, realize is that um, the port of Rotterdam is a very important energy uh, port, uh, which means that the uh, energy that that is imported uh, into Rotterdam is uh, three times the amount that the Netherlands needs itself, and it's uh, it's around 13% of the entire European need, uh, which means that a lot of the energy that is in the form of fossil fuels is transported through the Rotterdam area into other countries in Europe, such as uh, uh, Germany and Belgium. Um, 
and uh, as you can see for the from the uh, vessel uh, movements it's uh, it's an incredibly large and, and busy port let me go to the next slide oh that's not the next slide <laughs> Yes, right. Uh, like I said uh, before, um, we are working uh, towards a carbon neutral uh, position in 2050. Um, and we have a very uh, uh, yeah, tight target for 2030, which is uh, fit for uh, 55, uh, which means a 55% CO2 reduction uh, in 2030. Um, we are based our um, strategy on four domains. Um, and I'd like to take you to the, through those uh, four domains uh, quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I myself uh, am very active in domain one and two uh, and, and slightly less so in three and four, uh, but, but uh, all are, are very important. Um, first one is really looking at efficiency and in infrastructure. Uh, think, uh, 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 yeah, decoupling heat, uh, from industrial installations to use in uh, household uh, heating uh, or city heating. Um, think about portals, which is a CO2 capture uh, project, uh, hydrogen infrastructure, electricity. Uh, for domain two, with the new energy systems, really this is where we want to replace all the fossil fuel streams with uh, new energy, such as uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, in whatever form or, or shape it takes in terms of carriers. Um, the new feedstock system, domain three, uh, is very, very important. We are going towards uh, a lot of new uh, raw materials. Uh, think about recycling, uh, recycling plastics, um, waste to uh, chemicals, uh, pyrolysis oil, all these sort of uh, uh, feedstocks that uh, will be used in the future a lot. And, and, and last but not least, it's the sustainable transport. And, and here you have to be careful because of your course, uh, you have to realize that a lot of the uh, CO2 emissions uh, are made by uh, deep sea freight, which is actually exactly the same amount as we emit in, in Rotterdam uh, in, in its entirety. Um, so it is about 25 million tons. Um, and we also emit in the port around 25 million tons. Now, the sustainable transport is really looking within the port what we can do to improve the CO2 uh, emissions. Um, however, with the new energy and the new fuels, uh, we also hope to participate and to share uh, in the uh, reduction of the CO2 emissions by the deep sea uh, vessels. Next slide, please. Right, next. Right, here are some of the projects that I've uh, mentioned briefly to you uh, before in terms of the infrastructure process um, uh, projects. The hydrogen backbone is important, of course. Uh, it will connect uh, the uh, hydrogen production and the imported hydrogen uh, with uh, uh, companies in the uh, Rotterdam area. But also we are looking at to connecting them uh, to the east uh, so Germany and the south of the Netherlands, uh, Gemmelot. So we're really looking to, uh, after uh, constructing the first phase, connecting this, this through to the hinterland. Obviously, we have to strengthen our electricity uh, infrastructure, especially if we are going to land uh, electricity from sea in larger quantities than originally uh, anticipated as we are now really pushing towards uh, more uh, hydrogen produced from, from wind uh, at sea, at the North Sea. Um, Portals project, which is the CO2 storage, uh, capturing CO2 and storing it under the North Sea. Uh, the, the heat network, residual heat network, I already mentioned that uh, briefly to you uh, before, uh, apart from uh, uh, city heating and, and household heating. You can also think, of course, about the greenhouses that are in abundance between here and, and The Hague. So also a, a, a good way to, to share uh, some of the heat. Uh, and uh, H-Vision, uh, which is uh, looking at uh, uh, capturing CO2 from off gases, uh, 
before those off gases are uh, reused again in the in the refineries, in the large facilities. And as you can see, um, if all the uh, projects happen in time, we will have a huge CO2 reduction in 2030, uh, which will contribute to our targets and meet them actually. Um, and with the recent Repower EU initiatives from uh, uh, Franz Timmermans uh, for the European Union, that uh, that looks uh, uh, like it's getting a big impulse. Next, please. Yeah, this is one of the uh, uh, connecting pipelines that are planned to the uh, to the North Rhine-Westphalia area. It's uh, uh, CO2 uh, from uh, Germany and, and the south of Holland back into Portos project and hydrogen into the, the east of the, the country. Um, so, uh, and, and then we're also looking at uh, sharing that uh, bundle, it's called the Delta Corridor, with uh, uh, several chemical uh, pipelines. Next. Yes, the uh, next, the, uh, the, the, this is the uh, predictions that we made in terms of the hydrogen need in uh, uh, Rotterdam uh, and, and beyond. Uh, in 2050, you can see 20 million tons. Uh, initially, people thought that there was a, a very uh, optimistic view. Uh, recently, that, had, that has uh, changed. And uh, we are thinking that maybe it's not, uh, 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 yeah, daring enough or not uh, ambitious enough. Um, and uh, certainly the 2030 point that you see now where the imported hydrogen, uh, the big yellow flag uh, is starting to increase uh, might be uh, too late. And we're really now pushing that point forward where we're starting importing hydrogen at an earlier stage. Uh, from the 20 million tons that we anticipate to import in uh, 2050, uh, we, we think 13 or so will be transported through to uh, the um, uh, Germany and, and, and seven is for our own use. Um, but you can see uh, that uh, around 90% uh, of the hydrogen that we need will need to be uh, imported. So even if we use all the capacity that we can create in on the North Sea, there's still a lot of import that needs to be done. Uh, and of course, where does that import come from? Uh, that will obviously be uh, from areas where there's lots of solar and uh, lots of uh, wind. Uh, and then uh, the hydrogen will uh, need to be uh, attached to a carrier uh, or it can become, uh, can come here in uh, liquid hydrogen uh, form. Next. Yeah, here's a, another picture of some of the uh, areas where there's lots of uh, uh, wind and, and, and solar. Uh, obviously, we're also maybe looking at uh, geothermal and, and, and hydro, uh, but most of it is, uh, is uh, solar and uh, uh, wind. Um, and uh, with a lot of these countries and companies, we have MOUs now uh, to, to help them uh, uh, facilitate them uh, realizing their projects and transporting the product to uh, to Rotterdam. Next, yeah, this is the uh, the, the hydrogen uh, backbone, the big white pipeline. There, it's a 24-inch uh, uh, open-access hydrogen backbone of uh, 30 kilometers that runs uh, through the the port area uh, from uh, the. Uh, conversion park where we have uh, space for four to 250 megawatt uh, electrolysis uh, facilities uh, to Pernis, uh, which, uh, which is the shell uh, uh, plant where uh, the first uh, hydrogen produced from electrolysis in conversion park uh, will, be, will be used. Uh, this uh, pipeline is uh, uh, in design and hopefully construction will start at the beginning of 2023. Um, the gray pipeline on the top is the Portos pipeline for the CO2 capture. And you see some of the other uh, initiatives that, uh, that I've mentioned also uh, on this uh, map. Can we go to the next? Yeah, you can skip this one. It's just an explanation of the projects. This is the timeline. It's, uh, it's uh, ambitious. 
uh, but we are on track. And it also mentioned some of the other initiatives that uh, that I haven't been able to explain to you in the short time available. Uh, but uh, the, the presentation will be shared with you uh, after the uh, webinar. And then, of course, you can uh, study this, this uh, at, at your leisure. Can we go to the next, please? Yeah, the circular men. Uh, yeah, this is this is important, and this is already. You see, there's a lot of talk about uh, security of supply, uh, environment, uh, uh, the ambitions for uh, CO2 not neutral, uh, but uh, the the new feedstock um, transition is is going to be key uh, to achieve this in the long run, uh, and we can already see that from this picture that uh, the, the oil and gas uh, part or a bit of this is actually 80% uh, in 2030. And that is the ambition. So that means that although it looks great and we are already saying, okay, feedstock, biofeedstock, uh, waste recycling, um, it's still very, very um, initial phase uh, and a lot more needs to be done uh, to work on actually uh, achieving these uh, these goals and have more uh, uh, biofuels, uh, more recycling, uh, recycling of batteries, um, uh, recycling of plastics, etc. So uh, this is becoming a, a very important uh, topic in the in the near future. I would uh, I would uh, expect. Go to the next one. The supply chain. Yes, great. Um, I already mentioned this to you, 25 million tons in, in deep sea freight. Um, but uh, there is also uh, something to be had on uh, the, the port side and in the transportation. Um, and for example, uh, you can look at uh, efficiency initiatives, um, modal shifts uh, and, and fuel shifts to, to work towards a cleaner port. Uh, at least, and on the longer run, if we uh, develop new fuels for deep sea uh, freight uh, transportation, such as ammonia or methanol, uh, or, or it, it would, uh, I think, in the future also enable uh, the deep sea freight to, to be decarbonized. In the next slide, there are a couple of uh, uh, interesting examples of what you can do on a more local level. Yeah. For example, shore power, uh, when these uh, big shift ships are in the port, also, for example, the cruise uh, ships, they, uh, they continue uh, with their engine running for all the facilities. And of course, if we can uh, use green uh, electricity instead of uh, uh, diesel fuels, that, uh, that helps uh, tremendously. Uh, we've got a, a couple of uh, yeah, very ambitious targets for 2030. Uh, to uh, create more um, uh, shore power. But the picture that you see there, it's actually a 30 megawatt shore power project for two big uh, oil uh, rig maintenance ships uh, uh, that are uh, at the port uh, for several uh, months uh, a year for, for maintenance purposes. Um, Sustainable inland shipping, uh, the first uh, barge, uh, fully electrical barge, has uh, started operations this year, which is great. Uh, we need more of these ships. Um, recently, a big grant has been uh, received to, to develop this further. So this is certainly something that has a future. Um, and the next example, I think, which is, which is for me always very uh, interesting, is that uh, just by uh, a cleaning the hull of a big uh, uh, vessel, uh, you can see, save 10 to 15% in efficiency. And if you realize that a uh, container ship needs around a million liters of diesel uh, fuel uh, to go to Singapore uh, and back, for example, then uh, uh, you can understand that that uh, saves uh, a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, with that, I wanted to finish it so that uh, we stay on schedule. Uh, but I'm very happy, like I said before, to, to answer further questions later or through the uh, chat uh, or Q&A. Thanks, thanks, Mark. That's, um, that's great. I've, I've got a couple of uh, 
quick questions before we move on and we'll come back together at the panel at the end. But um, in your um, roadmap or, or timescales, you, you mentioned a number of different hydrogen carriers. You talked about green ammonia, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers and liquid hydrogen. Which of which do you think are going is most likely to be um, a carrier of choice in in the in the short to medium term? Well, that's a good question. I think um, uh, it is going to be ammonia. Uh, I think around eighty percent of the projects that we see developing uh, in in other parts of the world now uh, are looking at using ammonia uh, as the uh, the carrier of choice. Um, also, because there is already uh, some existing infrastructure. Uh, uh, in terms of terminals and ships, um, so that is uh, this probably the the one that is going to be chosen in the sh in the shorter term uh, to to work. Uh, on the longer term, uh, I think liquid hydrogen has still got a lot of potential, uh, but there are a lot of losses uh, during transportation and it comes very inefficient and expensive. Uh, to do that. Uh, so there's more technology uh, that needs to be developed to make that process uh, uh, yeah, more efficient and therefore uh, economically viable. Uh, and if, if it is to be green ammonia, um, how do you see the balance in the, early, in the early market phase of cracking that ammonia back to hydrogen or using it as a bunkering fuel or as a feedstock for fertilizers? So how, 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 do you, how do you see? Well, well I think... Um, it is difficult to, to, to really uh, judge, but uh, certainly if you can use the ammonia <laughs> immediately without cracking it back to hydrogen, uh, that, that is uh, beneficial for certain uh, processes. Even uh, uh, they are experimenting now in Japan with using the ammonia in, in uh, coal-fired electricity plants. Um, but uh, also uh, there is a need for from companies in, in, in North Rhine Westphalia just want to open the tap and, and get hydrogen uh, and not bother with, with uh, you know, cracking ammonia on their sites. So yes. uh, I, I think at least uh, a third or so of the ammonia will need to be cracked. Um, uh, we hope the bunker uh, market will develop quickly and also take a fair share of the, the, the rest, say another 30 and then maybe a, 30 or so uh, can be used as, uh, as feedstock immediately. Fantastic. So, uh, and, and in terms of the, the, the hydrogen, the, the high transport pipeline, that 30 km, kilometers uh, that you showed on, on your map, will that be transporting green hydrogen only or is there a um, mix? The, 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 the preference, of course, is, is, is green. Uh, however, the pipeline does not discriminate. You, you can put anything in it. Um, but uh, in, initially, I think it's going to be green and, and quite a lot of blue because intermediate term, uh, there, there, there is a need for also blue. Otherwise, we cannot achieve our target. Um, and uh, yes, in terms of you know, con continuity of supply, um, and if you uh, can, can work it in terms of certification, uh, 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 small amounts of gray in terms of emergencies, etc. I, I could imagine, but the the, the goal is is green. Um, in the inter, you know, short to intermediate term, I think there will be also quite a lot of blue, uh, but eventually it will be mostly green because we see the demand of the customers is is green. Yeah, and you talked about that pipeline being open access. That is truly open to anybody who wants to connect to that pipeline. Yes, I, that's that's correct. In terms of uh, quantities and offtake, of course, there's a certain threshold where you say it's probably uh, more economic to have a, 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 another way of supply. But uh, yeah. yeah, for the larger uses, uh, anybody can connect. That's fantastic. Um, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, if you go and then come back at the end, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's Stefan Meyer from Elegen. Stefan uh, graduated in naval architecture and offshore engineering and joined GTT Group as a hydrodynamics engineer. Stefan moved into business development, uh, followed by a position as general manager of GTT subsidiary in Singapore, where he focused on the uh, group network expansion and building relationships with key clients in Asia Pacific. Stefan is now commercial director of Elegen, 
and is responsible for developing the company activities in the field of PEM electrolysis. So, Stefan, over to you. Great. Thank you, Diana. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak uh, this morning about uh, electrolyzers and how to scale up um, electrolysis. So I'm, uh, I'm Stefan, I'm the commercial director of Elogen. Uh, Elogen is uh, a company which has been uh, focusing on uh, PEM electrolyzers for more than 15 years. Uh, we have been uh, involved in, uh, in the stacks, but as well all the, the equipment around to, to have the electrolyzer running. Um, the company joined GTT Group end of uh, 2020, so that's why I've been uh, uh, recently in, uh, in the company. Um, today, we're about 60 people in, um, in Elogen uh, on two, uh, two offices in our uh, headquarter close to Paris and uh, in Germany, in Cologne. Uh, and we keep growing. We expect to be around 80 people uh, by, by the end of the year. And uh, we have uh, ambitions to have um, a production capacity of stacks of uh, about one gigawatt. Um, thanks to um, a project uh, linked to IPSI that I, I, will, uh, I will detail a little bit later. Today in Elogen, we are involved in a uh, few markets. Um, we started with, uh, with mobility, um, so uh, electrolyzers uh, producing hydrogen uh, dedicated to, um, to be used by uh, refueling stations and mobility. Um, and then we have uh, applications related to power to gas, especially methanations. Uh, we have uh, a few methanation projects. And uh, today we're working on uh, power to power and industrial projects, uh, especially uh, steel industry. Uh, for example, we, we signed a partnership with, uh, with a company earlier this year in Spain to, to develop solutions to decarbonize steel, uh, steel, uh, steel making industry. So we are uh, moving uh, across the, the value chain uh, from mobility, power to gas, power to, uh, power to power, but also industry uh, that, as mentioned just before, uh, would require quite large uh, capacities of uh, electrolysis. And so these are the reasons why we are uh, today at Elogen working uh, quite extensively in scaling up, of course, electrolyzers and PEM, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers. And uh, our conviction, uh, we believe that technology uh, will be uh, the cornerstone uh, to industrialize uh, green hydrogen production, carbon-free hydrogen production. But uh, that's not that easy. It won't, uh, it won't happen overnight. Um, there are quite a few challenges to, to overcome. Here, here are a few of them uh, that we, we try to, to summarize uh, around three themes. Um, one uh, would be linked to more the technology performance. Um, so it's how to uh, improve, how to optimize the coupling of the electrolyzer with intermittent energy. Uh, we have been used to couple electrolyzers uh, with the grid, uh, but we are talking more and more to have a direct coupling between wind turbines or solar panels and the electrolyzer. So there are over um, there are some adaptations to, to be made and uh, performance of the technology in terms of services to the grid, uh, a type of business model where you can use the electrolyzer uh, to go on or off uh, to, uh, to help in the grid balancing. Uh, so these are directly linked to the, to the technology performance and PEM, thanks to its reactivity, has uh, some role to play here. Another theme uh, that we, uh, we are keen to explore. Um, one is large-scale storage of hydrogen, and uh, especially we are involved in a project in France uh, called Ipster, where uh, it will, uh, uh, it will, the electrolyzer will be used uh, with underground storage in uh, in a saline cavity in salt cavern, uh, where uh, this uh, this project uh, in um, in uh, in Etre in France. Uh, will demonstrate the feasibility of uh, large-scale storage in, uh, in saline, uh, saline cavity. And uh, another field to explore, and we do believe in, in the group uh, in it, is offshore electrolysis. That was the case of Mark, where we produce electricity offshore, but we bring electricity back to the shore where electrolysis takes place. Um, but if we are too far from the shore, uh, some uh, people are developing offshore electrolysis. So production of electricity offshore through wind turbines, most of the case. 
um, and direct electrolysis uh, on the sea on floating platform or directly on the foot of the wind turbine. So here, uh, this is uh, a brand new uh, a brand new application where we need to qualify uh, electrolyzer for offshore applications. And uh, I'm a naval architect. Uh, it's not that obvious uh, to put uh, a thing on the sea. Um, and the last theme um, is more linked to the industrial effort uh, that we have to do as uh, an electrolyzer provider. Uh, one is uh, increase the electrolyzer capacity in terms of size, size of the electrolyzer, but also production capacity and the cost reduction. So these, as uh, a technology provider, we have to we have to do it. It's our duty. So why uh, this and our, our um, motto, our what we keep in mind when we develop our our systems, is that when we look at the hydrogen cost, the total cost of ownership of um, of hydrogen, depending on the the connection on where the electricity could be coming from, uh, there will be uh, some differences in the cost. But still, we can see that the power part, uh, and so the cost of electricity, is the main driver in the cost of hydrogen. So the share can vary, uh, but it's still a, a main part, let's say 50, 50 to 80% uh, is linked to the price of electricity. We, Elogen, we cannot do anything there. Uh, we are not uh, uh, a developer of the, of the fields, of the renewable fields. Uh, but what we can do is to work on the efficiency on the equipment uh, that we couple with, uh, with the, the electricity. And this drives our uh, R&D. So we have uh, a strong R&D team today, uh, which is uh, a bit more than one third of, uh, of our staff. Um, so we, we built a strong R&D team uh, around uh, a few aspects of the electrolyzer. Uh, one team is dedicated to the research on the materials themselves that we put inside the stacks. Um, so they have their own laboratory, their own electrolyzers, their own, own tools to, uh, to test new membranes, new catalysts, uh, reduce the amount of iridium or replace the catalysts, uh, new architecture, new techniques, uh, with, uh, of course, the objective to increase the efficiency of the stacks and reduce the, the cost. And for this, we, we signed up uh, last uh, December. Uh, a partnership with a university which is close to us in uh, close to Paris in Saclay, um, which is quite famous in uh, in this kind of material research. So we have a partnership today with a university to work on new materials. The the research the the outcome of this team is then integrated in a, a team dedicated to the stacks. Uh, so developing stacks, developing new stacks, and especially um, larger stacks. So we have a target uh, to um, today uh, in our roadmap. Uh, it's a one megawatt stack that will be qualified by the end of this year uh, and commercialized early 2023. Uh, so that's the first step and then scale up with uh, larger stacks um, a, a bit later. Uh, we're already working on it, but commercially available a bit later. And a, a, another team which is working on everything around the stack. So what we call the BOP. Um, so on, on the loops, on the, the way to, uh, to deal with the, the water, the, to deal with the gas that is produced by the stacks. Um, so we have again a team uh, working on, on the BOP. And for us, all these uh, R&D effort is towards three uh, main aspects which are needed today uh, when we want to produce green hydrogen. One I mentioned is efficiency. Uh, so try to produce as much kilogram of hydrogen for any kilowatt of electricity coming into the electrolyzer. Another element, uh, which is for us a key, uh, a key element is the aging. So as you may know, stacks uh, degrade over time. Uh, so increase the, the lifetime uh, of, the, of the stacks. So one key element so that we can replace the stacks later um, on compared to what we, we are doing today. So increase the lifetime or uh, understand uh, uh, what needs to be done to, to keep the stacks uh, running for longer. And the other one aspect uh, uh, in terms of performance is the flexibility. So being able 
uh, with the electrolyzer to operate over a large range. Uh, so for example, our uh, electrolyzer are able to run from 5% to 100% of the nominal load or even beyond for grid balancing. We can go beyond 100% typically uh, for this kind of application, but having a large range of um, operating uh, uh, the electrolyzer, 5, 100% helps when you have intermittent energy, fluctuating energy uh, coming in. Um, so this is uh, also a key, uh, a key element for us when we design our equipment. And on top of that, um, having the right efficiency for all these loads. So um, making sure that the efficiency we have for the system is not just one single point, but making sure that the efficiency of the system is good over a large range of the operating of the load range of the electrolyzer. So that's the focus. Um, one pillar uh, of the company is uh, this, uh, this strong R&D with all this, uh, these aspects uh, in mind when we develop our, our products. And uh, another pillar, which is key, I, I already started to hint, uh, one of them is the, the production capacity. Um, so today uh, we produce our stacks in France. Uh, we are the only player or the only PEM electrolyzer company in, uh, in France. Uh, we are able uh, to produce equivalent 160 megawatt of power of stacks uh, in a year today, thanks to a new production line we just commissioned earlier this year. Uh, so we increased our production capacity early 2022 um, with a new mechanized uh, production line and in a white room. So the, the stacks today are assembled in a completely controlled atmosphere to, to make sure that the, the stacks are um, are assembled with good quality. Uh, so that's the first step in terms of uh, production. And the second step, uh, and this one is linked to the one gigawatt I announced um, earlier in the presentation. Uh, this is uh, a gigafactory uh, of Stacks, uh, which is um, a project we submitted to IPSI, important project of common European interest. So we are one of the 15 projects uh, pre-selected, pre-notified by the French government. Um, and so we are almost at the end of the process. And uh, if everything goes uh, like it is planned right now, uh, early 2025, we will be able to produce in this new factory uh, equivalent of one gigawatt of power uh, of stacks uh, in, this, uh, in this new factory, which will be again located in France. Um, so quite an ambitious uh, roadmap. And one gigawatt is just with one shift of eight hours. So technically we can do more if, um, if we need like two or three gigawatts if we go to, uh, to three shifts a day. I'm just mentioning here production of stacks and not production of electrolyzer. Um, and this is linked in fact to uh, the way uh, we, we operate our business model. So at Telogen, we produce the stacks uh, in our current factory and the, the future one. We then integrate these stacks into the electrolyzer. So the electrolyzer for us is all the BOP. So the, the water intake, water treatment, uh, power conversion, uh, drying of the hydrogen, uh, cooling system. So that's the entire electrolyzer. So we fabricate the stacks here in our factory. Then we integrate the stacks in the electrolyzer. So we do the design of the electrolyzer. Of course, we have an engineering team. So all the process, ele automation, electrical part is designed by, by us. But the assembly um, is made um, in, uh, in a different place. So we, uh, we work with partners for the assembly, for the piping uh, uh, assembly, electrical connection of the electrolyzer. We work with partners in France, uh, in Spain, in Germany. So we, we assemble this BOP, in fact, in the country. We have the, the, the freedom to assemble the BOP in the country that we want, especially where the electrolyzer will be uh, finally located. Um, and uh, then we, we provide a containerized solution like this. For bigger projects, uh, containerized for, for us is up to 20 megawatts. But if we go beyond, if we want to, uh, to, to go beyond 20 megawatts, if we want to scale up the, the, the capacity, um, we are working here uh, again uh, with partners uh, on larger scale electrolysis plants. So no more containerized. Uh, it's more like a plant, so things in a building. So that, that just uh, a conceptual view of a larger scale electrolyzer plant. 
where you are more in a building, but with centralized uh, water treatment, centralized cooling. And then you have, let's say, racks of or skids, of stacks and separators that are aligned inside the building. So slightly different strategies, slightly different way of working compared to a containerized solution where you have everything integrated uh, and duplicated in, uh, in the containers. Uh, so here you are more on a factory with uh, different constraints, different way uh, to think in terms of maintainability and availability. And so here we, we are working with uh, EPC companies who are not uh, civil engineering. We don't know how to do foundations. So in that case, we work with, uh, with EPC companies to deliver a turnkey solutions to, to the customers uh, for, for, for the bigger plants. So above 20 megawatt, 20 megawatt typically. So that, that's it, uh, a, a quick overview of um, what we're doing in, uh, in Elogen, especially to, uh, to ramp up the, the uptake and the production capacity, the efficiency. So quite ambitious R&D, quite ambitious industrial plan. Uh, and we keep uh, in mind that we need to still validate uh, a few key links in the, in the chain. So always keen to, to work on new, uh, new innovative projects. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Thanks, Stefan. Um, you you talked a bit about um, your one megawatt stack being commercially available uh, early next year, I think you said. Yep. Um, could you expand a little bit on the main elements that can lead, uh, that you think will lead to cost reduction in the stacks themselves? Sure, yes. Um, there are, there are a few. Uh, one, is, uh, one is linked to the material themselves. Uh, so there are new membranes uh, coming in, thinner, thinner membranes. So the, the supply chains uh, are being uh, developed. Uh, a lot of improvement is ongoing right now uh, by, um, by suppliers of membranes, suppliers of catalysts, new catalysts. So all the work uh, we are doing right now in the materials, uh, so it's the, the first aspect of the R&D team, uh, is quite uh, huge. And the efforts which are made could come very quickly uh, to, to reduce the cost. So one is the, the material themselves that could be uh, either cheaper or more efficient uh, for the same price. Um, and the second aspect is just massification. When we look at... Uh, especially PEM. Uh, PEM electrolyzers has mostly been today confined to the smaller sizes. Uh, and by just massification, making bigger, it's just an economy of scale. Uh, cost is just uh, being driven, uh, driven down uh, naturally by just the economy of scale. That's why we are moving to bigger stacks and also uh, big factories to, to produce more. Okay, excellent. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Elegen's strategy in terms of um, developing or responding to the uptake of hydrogen globally? Sure. Uh, yes, it's uh, here again. Um, we are not working alone. Uh, we don't intend to do everything by ourselves. Um, so as we, we work with partners for uh, BOP or EPC, in fact, to, uh, when, to go outside Europe, uh, let's say, uh, but even within Europe, uh, so to go uh, internationally, uh, our strategy is always to go with some partnerships um, to assemble part of the system uh, for maintenance as well. We, uh, we need to think that once, once the system is delivered, we need to support. Uh, the operations. So for all this, uh, we, we work with partners. So we, um, we just announced, or it was last month, uh, so we announced in May uh, already two partnerships in that, uh, in that sense, one in uh, South Korea, one in Australia, uh, with uh, uh, companies that will uh, be our uh, contractor locally to assemble the stacks and eventually do the, uh, sorry, the BOP, assemble the BOP uh and uh maintain the the electrolyzer locally uh so these are two uh two partnerships um we have the, this partnership with this uh, spanish company as well they are specialized in uh factory plants in uh, for steel making we, we are not specialized in furnace and things like this so we need to accompany also this and be uh, with uh, with uh, specialized companies who know we know really the the requirements 
So we go together. So partnerships uh, to uh, to build overseas uh, that we will continue. We won't stop in, uh, only in Australia and, and Korea. So we have already some uh, actions ongoing with uh, over uh, in other countries. That's that's great. Thank, thanks, Stefan. Um, if you can come back at the end, that will be great. Sure. I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who is John Sullivan from SSE Renewables. John is the Galway Hydrogen Hub Project Manager. Um, he used hydrogen in the 1990s in the microchip manufacturing sector and said he never expected to encounter that gas again when he moved into renewables in 2008. For all roads lead to hydrogen, John, you should know, you should know that. Um, so SSE have two demonstrator hydrogen projects in development. One is in Scotland and the other is in Galway on the west coast of Ireland. John's going to give us an update uh, this morning on uh, the Galway hydrogen project. Over to you, John. Good morning. Thank you, Diana. And uh, thank you everybody for the opportunity to present uh, to you this morning our Galway Hydrogen Hub project. Um, just going to move to slideshow here. And hopefully you can see my slide deck OK. So the, the Galway Hydrogen Hub uh, essentially is a it's a demonstrator project that um, we are developing in the west coast of Ireland and um, unfortunately in Ireland there is a vacuum of hydrogen strategy regulation and policy so this uh, is presenting some challenges for us in order to overcome these challenges uh, uh, sorry Don just to let you know we can only see the first slide so I think you might need to come out of um, full screen mode if that's okay come out of full screen mode yeah Is that okay, Tim, there? Yeah, that's great. No worries. Okay, thank you. Um, so in order to, I suppose, streamline the project and help us overcome some of these um, policy and regulatory gaps, uh, we decided to set up a consortium. The consortium is consisting of our local university, NUI Galway, SSE Renewables, from whom I work, the Port of Galway, who is the, the, the local um, harbour company, and then basically public transport company, CIE, public bus company, Bus Air, and then an airline which travels um, to islands on the West Coast and some ferry companies. And, and the reason we came together was to try and synchronize the supply of hydrogen with the demand for hydrogen to make sure that we overcame this chicken and egg type of problem, as it is called, that the supply and demand would basically arrive at the same time. In order to try and ensure <coughs> that um, we were somewhat aligned with government departments. We also invited the Department of Transport, the Centralised Regulator for Utilities and the National Transport Authority that, that purchased uh, public buses and public transport vehicles to join the consortium also to make sure that they're aware of our plans and that um, they were supportive. So in April of this year, um, our Taoiseach, um, or who is essentially the Prime Minister of Ireland, came to Galway and he announced the the opening of the project and we it was the first time we unveiled our intentions and it was very interesting that the amount of um, interest we've had from various hydrogen off-takers in the transport industry um, both in buses and in heavy duty vehicles um, but also in some alternative industri industries also what we are trying to do essentially is I guess Chris would call it a hydrogen valley. And by hydrogen valley, what I mean is a, a regional ecosystem where the we've strong linkages between research at the university, um, strong linkages into other hydrogen projects across the continent, heaven in the Netherlands, uh, the Green Highlands, Gencom, and so on. And that we are we have constant access to researchers, academics, and so on to help us optimize what we're trying to do. Also trying to create strong links between production, distribution, transportation companies. So we're trying to essentially partner with companies that have a level of competence, expertise, and so on, such that our delivery cycle time will be minimized. I'd mentioned already that it's very important that we synchronize the supply and demand of hydrogen. And uh, that's something that we're 
doing through a supply chain group. So any party who's interested in hydrogen in the west of Ireland has the opportunity to join this supply chain group to understand, let's just say, what the benefits are, but also to help us forecast how much hydrogen they will need for their particular end use applications so we can scale our plant. Obviously, green hydrogen is um, the, the preferred, let's just say, uh, form of hydrogen for this hydrogen valley. Um, there has been some, let's just say, challenges in terms of what the definition of green hydrogen is compared to renewable hydrogen, compared to clean hydrogen and so on. So what we are doing in, in our instance is basically trying to operate that um, in a mode whereby we will have corporate PPAs uh, to ensure that our, our hydrogen is green. Um, the recent EU Delegated Act um, does cause some concern as to the future and how there is a requirement to have temporal and geographical matching between your renewable energy project and your hydrogen plant. So this is something that um, yeah, we will be providing feedback to and uh, we hope there'll be some more flexibility afforded in the EU Delegated Act. So I suppose in a nutshell, um, we would view the Gullah Hydrogen Hub as an important step towards enabling development of a new hydrogen economy in Ireland because this would be the, the first hydrogen project in Ireland. So if you look at the concept then of what we're trying to achieve, as mentioned, um, we would have a renewable power source um, basically from our renewable assets in Ireland. We have one gigawatt of onshore and uh, we have basically a significant uh, number of gigawatts of offshore planned over the next couple of years. So we'll have a corporate power purchase agreement coupled with guarantees of origin, which will basically ensure that uh, our hydrogen is classified as green, which allow us to have a premium cost for that for the transport sector. The electrolysis will take place at the port in Ireland and in the UK. The, let's say the preferred approach um, for manufacturing hydrogen at the moment is to manufacture hydrogen at the renewable site for example, on a mountain at a wind farm or in, in a solar farm. Um, we've been looking at the port of Rotterdam uh, that, that Mark presented earlier and looked at other projects and we really feel that it's, it's very important to manufacture hydrogen at the demand center. This reduces the levelized cost of hydrogen to the end user and uh, negates the need for a significant amount of transportation. Once we've manufactured the hydrogen in the plant, we'll then basically store it um, most likely in type three storage at the port. And from there to be dispensed by two different channels, either through a hydrogen refueling station and into buses and trucks at the port, or we can also take the hydrogen offsite and tube trailers to other hydrogen refueling stations at remote locations. So our little ecosystem will, will start off as follows. Uh, we'll have renewable power as mentioned for incorporate PPAs. Um, we will manufacture hydrogen at Galway Harbour. In turn, we'll then basically store it at Galway Harbour and then also dispense it at Galway Harbour through a hydrogen refueling station. Our primary and anchor tenant or off taker for the hydrogen will be the public bus fleet, uh, also some um, heavy goods vehicles from private companies. And as mentioned, we're working with um, two ferry companies, one that transfers cargo to this group of islands called the Iron Islands off the West Coast, and another company that transfer for, transfers 400,000 passengers, primarily tourists from the mainland to the Iron Islands every year. Also working with a small aircraft company who plan to move to hydrogen propulsion in 2027, 2028. So if we look closer then at the actual site that uh, we're proposing to um, Center this a wee bit. If you look at the site, then we're proposing to, to build on um, what we have here is uh, is Galway Harbour, Galway Bay to the south. We have a railway track to the north, and our electrolyzer site is just here in this triangular shaped site. Um, what you'll notice is that our off takers, the CIE bus depot, these have they have 40 buses based at this location. The Intercity Connects Depot, which runs buses and coaches um, between the major cities in Ireland, and also the ferries are all conveniently located um, quite close to the actual hydrogen, um, hydrogen manufacturing plant. Looking closer at the plant then, in terms of uh, dimensions, it was interesting to see 
the, the presentation from Elogen around uh, going to a, a, a building type structure away from the more, more modular approach uh, and so on. Um, at this juncture, our, our intention would be, would be to go with the modular approach just because of um, its availability and flexibility at, at the moment. Um, so essentially what we will have are a set of five megawatt modules, module containers, which contain electrolyzers to the, to the north. Um, they'll be supported by ancillary equipment uh, for purging, for basic compression and so on. That, and that uh, hydrogen then will basically be stored in permanent storage um, to, the, to the south of the site. Um, these storage containers will contain approximately one ton of hydrogen each at 350 bar. Um, you can notice the, the blast walls and firewalls around the equipment. Um, in the middle of the site, we have uh, two tube trailers, which allows us to remove hydrogen from the permanent storage and bring it to off-site hydrogen refilling stations. And then to the west of the site, we have two dispensing bays to refuel buses or trucks or whatever type of type of vehicle. Then you notice from the from the south of the site, um, this is an elevation showing the height. So our maximum height is about six meters. So in total, our our land area is under one hectare. It's about three quarters of a hectare and uh, is six meters in height. So it's not a very conspicuous, not a very large plant and um, should be able to manufacture approximately eight tons of hydrogen per day. So just in terms of scope then briefly, um, the plant is up to 20 megawatts. Uh, we'll build it in five megawatt blocks um, based on the demand profile. Um, when we go online in 2025, um, we'll have eight tons of permanent storage two tube trailer positions, a hydrogen refueling station, a high voltage underground cable to actually feed the hydrogen plant, a high voltage um, substation, and our intention is then to be operational and be able to dispense hydrogen in quarter one of 2025. So what will the Gordon, what will the Galway Hydrogen Hub do then? What we're hoping is that um, this picture is from actually this Monday, where we had the public consultation launch. Uh, we had a hydrogen bus and hydrogen car and so on there to meet the media and meet the elected representatives um, in Ireland. And what we hope is that our Galway Hydrogen Hub project will accelerate the government's ambition around developing a hydrogen strategy with clear target timelines, clear policies, clear regulatory framework, and clear supports for hydrogen type projects. It's very clear to us that at the early stages, CAPEX support and OPEX support is really fundamental to try and get this industry off the ground in Ireland because the demand starting off will be very low. So if we look then at just a more, I suppose, um, you know, glo global perspective and we see where Ireland fits in, um, this is looking at a scale in terawatt hours of hydrogen. And what you can see is that we have countries here like Hungary and Ireland with very low ambition um, of you know, about one terawatt hour per year of hydrogen. And then that goes right up to the US where we see you know, very significant ambition around the manufacture of hydrogen. The green star signifies those countries that are looking at green hydrogen specifically for their, for their plans for the future. And we can see that um, that features quite strongly, particularly in Europe. And I suppose, if you think about Ireland, Ireland is a small country, but our area of uh, ocean or, or sea is seven times larger than our land mass. We have a huge renewable offshore wind opportunity, which means a, a huge renewable hydrogen opportunity also. And the, the challenge is that um, in the absence of strategy, policy, and, and regulatory framework, it's very hard to realize those ambitions. So we hope that um, Ireland will move to the right and show much more ambition around production in the future. So just to wrap up then, in terms of our vision, our vision is to try and enable decarbonization across all transport modes. Um, we're looking particularly at the heavy duty vehicle sector at the moment, um, buses, um, coaches between large cities and also trucks. Um, we're hoping that the Gauda Hydrogen Hub will build confidence in the hydrogen transition because 
let's just say it is a significant change um, of, uh, let's just say, mode. It's, it's a, it take, requires a complete rethink, particularly, again, in, in the absence of the proper supports. Um, so we hope that we'll be able to prove that the ecosystem is, let's just say, something that um, can be viable for all aspects of the supply chain. And we hope then also that hydrogen fuel station corridors will open up across Europe. This is going to be really important to enable HGV timely rollouts. We've seen the recent announcements from Volvo and from Daimler and uh, various other companies calling out for hydrogen refueling station corridors across Europe. And we indeed are pushing our government also here in Ireland to basically put to drive forward with hydrogen fuel station corridors across the country. So that concludes my presentation. And uh, thank you again for your time on behalf of uh, the Gaudi Hydrogen Hub Consortium. Thanks. Thanks, John. That, that's great. Um, a couple of questions, observations. I think um, you, you kind of outlined the, the lack of strategy as being a, a, a problem for Ireland. And it is perhaps a bit surprising, given, given the potential for renewables, that Ireland hasn't sort of grasped the mantle a bit on, on, on hydrogen. Do you have a sense that that is changing? I mean, there, there have been projects in Ireland, um, smaller, you know, GenCom and, and projects like that that have, you know, begun to raise the profile, and this one certainly will. Do you have a sense that that uh, the the need for uh, a clear strategy is becoming recognised within within the right uh, realms of of uh, yeah. Yeah, the Irish Parliament? Yeah, that, that's a great question. If you ask me that question. Last year, I would have been very despaired and have to say that it's it's difficult to say. We have seen since December of 2021 a huge shift at national government level in terms of ambition and understanding of the role that hydrogen will play in the Irish economy in the in basically help us to decarbonize various sectors. Um, and we have a hydrogen strategy that's due to go out for public consultation, hopefully this week. And hopefully that will bring us forward. Initial indications are that it's not ambitious enough and it does not align with industry's ambition, but at least it is a, a starting point. And I think to your point, Diana, it's, it's, it's been really important the projects, the Interact projects, for example, GenCom and others that have helped raise the profile get buses on the street in a pilot capacity and helped, uh, I suppose, um, help those people who lack vision to understand that these things can be realized, these things, these projects can be supported and that, um, and also to prove that the, the techno-economics and how that, how that modeling can be translated to reality. So th these types of projects are really crucial. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's, let's hoping that the hydrogen strategy for Ireland is 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 forthcoming. What other um, potential roadblocks do you see in terms of you know developing your your uh, Galway hydrogen hub? What else needs to be addressed? So I suppose because it's the first hydrogen plant in the Republic of Ireland, there will be certain planning hurdles um, that we will have to overcome. So we we spent a lot of time with the local authority educating them on hydrogen and answering their questions. Um, there, there is also um, a challenge with, you know, the regulator. We have two regulators. It hasn't been decided which one will actually be responsible for hydrogen. Uh, so that, that decision is really important. Otherwise, we're dealing with two different regulators um, in parallel. And um, then, of course, there is the famous grid challenges, trying to ensure that we have grid robustness. That won't be an immediate challenge, but we would foresee in towards the 2030 that unless we have significant grid upgrades, it could um, stifle the hydrogen economy also. No. OK, um, can, can you kind of articulate a bit, John, um, how important you think the, um, uh, the hydrogen economy is to Ireland's future? I, I think it's really key. We, we're a very small island nation. We don't have vast resources. Uh, we, we do have a very significant, I suppose, um, sea area around our coast uh, with very, very high, you know, average wind speeds. So we have a huge wind resource that we could translate into, let's just say, hydrogen um, resource and uh, for export. And take a note of, um, you know, Mark's plans around importation through, for example, the Port of Rotterdam. There's a huge opportunity there for us. 
And in, I suppose, a world of uncertainty in, 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 in many areas, uh, I think the one certainty is around hydrogen, it's exponential growth. So I think it's really important for Ireland in the decades ahead to develop this sector and really capitalise on the opportunity because other sectors, be they manufacturing, IT and so on, can be less certain in the decades ahead. Yeah. Thanks, John. That's that's fantastic. Thank you for now. Thank you. See you in a minute. Um, OK, our, our next speaker is Nick Garo from Energy Systems Catapult. Nick is a, has extensive experience as a project and program manager and engineer. He manages a wide variety of projects across the energy systems catapults activities, focusing recently on whole energy system modeling, both nationally and locally, um, optimizing integration of renewables and hydrogen into future energy systems, and developing in innovation tools for the wave and tidal energy sector. Um, okay, Nick, I'm gonna hand over to you, thank you. Excellent. Uh, good morning. I've uh, just lost my video. There we go. Sorry. Uh, let's put that back over there. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to hear some really interesting presentations, and I'm going to pick up on a few of the points as we go through that um, John and indeed others have, have said before and, and build on those. Um, so this morning, I'm going to talk briefly about the benefits, particularly of combining tidal power with electrolysis and how this can help remote communities in particular to achieve net zero as part of an optimized whole energy system approach. Now, I hope that for some of you, this will challenge a few uh, common preconceptions um, and encourage you to think differently about some of the commonly cited barriers to deployment, um, such as grid constraints that, that John was just talking about. Firstly, a lightning introduction to the Energy Systems Catapult for those who are not familiar with us. Um, our mission is to unleash innovation and open up new markets so that we can capture the clean growth opportunity. Now, uh, we are one of a network of nine catapult centres established by the UK government's lead innovation agency, Innovate UK. Um, and that network was set up to address key challenges in strategically important sectors in the UK, ours being energy systems. Um, ESC itself was set up to accelerate the transformation of the UK's energy system, and also to ensure that UK businesses and consumers can benefit from the opportunities in the, the clean growth agenda. Um, our status is, uh, is a little um, uh, confusing for quite a lot of people. We are actually an independent, not-for-profit centre of excellence. Um, we work by bridging gaps between industry, government, academia, research, and particularly we take a whole systems view of the energy system in pretty much everything that we do, which helps us to identify and then address innovation priorities and market barriers in order to, for us to decarbonize the energy system at the lowest possible cost. Uh, a team is headquartered in Birmingham, but we are spread around the country nowadays. Um, and it includes a very diverse range of technical, commercial and, and policy backgrounds. We have very, very broad range of expertise. We work with innovators from companies of all sizes um, to develop, test and scale their ideas. We also collaborate with industry, academia, and government to overcome the system barriers that we identify in the current energy markets to unlock the potential of new products and services and new value chains to actually achieve what we need to do. And our activities fall into two broad categories. Firstly, supporting innovators to commercialize and secondly, helping to design and deliver the future energy system to unlock that innovation. And to do that, um, typically we have a range of whole system models, a range of different expertise, tools, labs, um, engineering, policy areas, and so on that we can bring to bear. And I've listed just a few things on the right hand side there that we do. We really do a very broad range, so it is difficult to summarize, but there's some examples there to give you a flavor. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you have the, uh, access to the slides off, uh, afterwards, and there's lots more information on our, on our website. 
So the study I'm talking about today, um, as Diana mentioned at the, at the outset, is part of the ITEG project that's integrating tidal energy into the European grid. And the objectives in short for this uh, Interreg funded project are to develop uh, a two megawatt tidal stream energy generation device and to demonstrate that at EMEX test site in Orkney. Secondly, to develop and demonstrate a novel electrolyzer um, for generating hydrogen uh, at the site and helping to overcome grid constraints and use that hydrogen locally. And thirdly, which is the piece I'm going to talk about particularly today, around the understanding the whole system impact and value of that combined solution of tidal electricity generation with hydrogen generation storage and use. So, in doing that, what we're we trying to do really key to that is understanding how we might overcome things like the network constraints. Um, say, John touched on this, but they are very typical of island and remote communities. And along the way, also, the project intends, therefore, to support the rollout of marine energy solutions, especially ones which are then proven. Uh, and the expansion of green hydrogen. And along with that, developing new energy management system algorithms and overall risk reduction for future deployment of all the above technologies. And briefly, you can see the project team set out at the bottom there, led by EMAC. So what does the stuff look like? This is the turbine um, at two megawatts. Um, Orbital Marine Power's O2 turbine is the world's most powerful operational tidal turbine uh, at the time we're going to press. Um, and it incorporates numerous innovative design features. Um, I've listed a few of them there, but uh, it's quite a neat piece of kit. Uh, that's been in service since last summer and has been performing excellently during that period and is continuing to do so which is fantastic. And if you haven't seen and not familiar, I would strongly encourage you to all to this website. Um, it's, it's got some really lovely, uh, lovely footage on there. Later this year, the turbine will be joined by one of Elegen's PEM electrolyzers. Um, you heard Stefan earlier on um, talking about many aspects of that. Um, I just pull out one feature particularly of note for this particular project which is the flexibility of the uh, hydrogen production and its ability to ramp to match the variable production from renewables, uh, which is a, a key feature of interest to this project. As I mentioned, the turbines operating at the European Marine Energy Centre's tidal test and demonstration site. Uh, that's at the fall of Warness up in Orkney, right off the north coast of Scotland. Photo on the right there is EMEX substation and hydrogen production facility on the adjacent island of Edi, which is where the power is landed. So for our part in the project, well, the, as I mentioned, one of the key bits I want to like to talk about is the detailed modeling study that we carried out um, in the project. Um, we looked at the whole multi-vector energy system right across the Orkney archipelago. Um, that's all energy production, transmission and distribution and use in, in all forms right across the, the archipelago with one or two minor exceptions. Um, and we were looking to analyze the potential routes by which the Orkney uh, archipelago could achieve net zero targets at minimum system cost under a number of scenarios. Now, Orkney has many similarities with island and coastal communities across northwestern Europe and indeed elsewhere. Um, and so the findings are highly informative for such areas, which are often characterized by large tidal or wind energy resource potential, but very frequently constrained electricity grids. And we've also identified high impact targets for European rollout where this may coincide with significant hydrogen demand. So what did we find? For today, I've just pulled out a small selection of the findings um, just to whet your appetite with time is short this morning. Um, so firstly, what role can tidal power and hydrogen actually play in energy systems like Orkney's? 
Well, first of all, the primary energy has the potential to be a mixture of wind and tidal generation alongside some solar, uh, with the potential to export electricity from Orkney. Some of that is done already, but that can be scaled up further. Tidal generation itself, um, alongside wind, is particularly valuable, partly due to predictability, which is, is often cited, but also importantly due to the diversity and complementary generation profiles with wind and other renewables and the increased resilience and security of supply that it affords to the system. Hydrogen, for its part, can be used in varying proportions. Um, fuel cells, non-domestic buildings, that's typically commercial and industrial premises. Domestic buildings, that's mostly people's houses. Um, as well as for maritime purposes, fueling ferries and a range of other applications and local transport applications uh, onshore as well and could potentially be exported from Orkney if the market prices um, are high enough that uh, Orkney produced hydrogen can compete into that market. Um, Stefan talked a little earlier about the, the price makeup of the hydrogen and the fact that a lot of that is driven by the price of the electricity, which in remote communities can be a little higher, but there is nevertheless potential for, for, for export. For non-domestic buildings, hydrogen can be particularly important for decarbonizing uses that are hard to switch to electric heat, and therefore the options are very limited as to how to do that. And in those areas, typically things like industrial processes, hydrogen has a particularly high value in decarbonizing the whole energy system. So putting all of that together, along with the study, we found that the carbon emissions from the local area can be further reduced using tidal power and hydrogen. And in fact, it's unlikely that net zero could be achieved locally, except by involving hydrogen in the system. So um, very much validating what we hoped to find, but had an open mind to see. Looking at network constraints, um, I've got a few builds on this slide, so bear with me. I'd like to contrast two different ways of viewing the problem of network constraints and thus how they can be overcome. So first of all, viewing the problem typically as a supply side problem. Typically, most people would characterize the problem as variable renewables. And on the left hand side there, I've shown a representation of some tidal turbines and uh, wind turbines. That's then feeding into constrained grids represented in the center by the red uh, substation. And therefore you end up with curtailment of generation. And if you view the problem in that way as a supply side problem, you tend to introduce supply side solutions. So in this case, I've shown the addition of electrolysis and local storage of both uh, electricity and hydrogen close to the sites of renewable generation in order to try to overcome the demand by moving the hydrogen instead. You can then create hydrogen demand elsewhere. And in this case, I've shown a hydrogen refueling station for, for vehicles um, on, on the islands, um, which is a, an excellent way of, of, of doing it. However, you need to move the hydrogen from where it's generated to where you need to use the hydrogen. And that is not straightforward. Um, at the moment, EMEC have done an excellent job in getting systems up and running to move that by tube trailers, um, firstly by road and then by ferry in order to move it around the archipelago. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but that is far from straightforward. They've done a fantastic job thus far, but scaling that up to the levels we aspire to is, is difficult and commercially questionable. So by contrast, I'd like to have another way of looking at the system. And that is to look at the system as a whole, and thus you might formulate the problem differently as being to optimize the whole energy system. Now we've still got our renewable generation there on the left-hand side, but we know that we're going to want to decarbonize most of the buildings on the island, and that includes the local domestic properties close to the sources of generation. Now, many, not all, but the vast majority will be suitable for heat pumps. And so you can introduce a quite significant local electricity demand 
and use a proportion of that electricity very locally, right close to the generation sites. And that actually removes, reduces the amount of electricity you need to move across the network, overcoming in the near term some of the network constraints. Alongside that, you can then target your hydrogen use to the sorts of applications that I mentioned a moment ago, particularly industrial uh, processes and the like, where the use of that hydrogen has the greatest impact in decarbonizing the energy system. And you can then put the electrolysis and hydrogen storage close to that hydrogen demand. And now you can move the electricity instead, which is easier using some of the headroom on the network, at least in the near to medium term. And you can actually overcome a substantial part of the network constraints and reduce the impact of containment quite significantly. So in the near term, it is possible to do more than it is often cited. And I would encourage that way of looking at the problem. Now, I mentioned the difficulties in moving hydrogen around. We had a good look at the logistics and handling of hydrogen around an archipelago setting. Um, we've got a lot of detail here, but I've drawn a few points out. Um, onshore hydrogen distribution is relatively straightforward. It's not without its challenges, but it's reasonably well-established practices and is, is, is relatively easy to do. Maritime transport uh, by contrast, is much more complex. There are significantly more safety and legislative issues that need to be considered during the design process. Um, so at the moment, it's being moved by specially chartered ferries and scaling that up really is quite difficult. There are significant barriers to putting hydrogen transport onto passenger ferries, for example, which most of the ferries are for, for safety reasons. Um, and that regulatory burden is, is very significant. Now, we also looked at pipelines as an alternative, but those are quite unusual pipelines, typically short distances, but subsea between islands. And that's unusual and in some cases can be cost effective, but not always. And so we proposed a whole range of recommendations. I just pulled out four of those here. Firstly, for standardization of system design and key components, so it can be reused in other settings, other archipelagos and so on with much greater ease in overcoming the, the barriers. Strategic planning to be improved across the archipelago, so it's seen as a whole system solution. Thirdly, to explore the appetite for joint regulatory body, where there are currently numerous regulatory bodies that all need to be satisfied. And again, that was touched on earlier by the previous speakers. Um, there may be um, an appetite for a joint body or at least a joint approach between regulatory bodies to significantly ease that burden. And finally, possibly a joint approach to standards and a, 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 an identified standards lead for archipelagos, which could then help roll out. Now, having said all of that, it's important to look at the case for upgrading interconnectors. Now, many years ago, there was a proposal from SSE for upgrading uh, the Orkney to Caithness interconnector down to the Scottish mainland uh, for 220 megawatts. That was eventually conditionally approved by Ofgem, but subject to a requirement for a further 135 generate, gen uh, megawatts of generation to be commissioned first. Now, Orkney Islands Council have done their own research and found benefits of, of the order of 800 million pounds if that interconnector was built and the community was able to use it. Our own study in the project um, has shown that building that interconnector upgrade unlocks significant potential. Um, two main ways of doing that. Firstly, an increase in the cost effective wind and tidal generation deployment that can be put in. And whereas now Orkney is net more or less independent it still imports and exports at times of year if this were put in place then it could be almost entirely independent and import on only a couple of days a year so almost entirely independent secondly there is the possibility for export of significant quantities not just of wind and tidal generation but actually also of hydrogen which paradoxically is is unlocked by this electricity interconnector because of the system-wide changes that it enables. And as a result of that, this interconnector would be a no regrets decision. We looked at multiple scenarios and almost all of them. 
the interconnector would play a hugely valuable role and unlock system value. So we are arguing that there is a clear case for change in the present regulatory constraints and that that interconnector could be built immediately without the imposition of preconditions. And actually, if you look at the moves that are now going on for things like the West of Orkney uh, wind farm, there are discussions around private wire there in significantly greater quantity. And so there is really a case for looking at a much higher rating for this interconnector that's actually been proposed. Now, finally, I'd like to just talk a little bit about potential European rollout. Nick, we've got one, one minute, sorry. That's lovely, thank you, that's the last slide, Jez. Uh, so the tidal stream capacity in the UK has been estimated to be something like 10 to 15 gigawatts in the UK alone. Uh, what we then looked at was the potential across Europe um, to gain the maximum advantage of combining these two technologies where three factors coincide. First of all, you need obviously the tidal resource that's got to be accessible. Second, we looked at constraints on exporting the power. And thirdly, the demand for hydrogen. Now, those spots that we identified are identified on the map there on the right hand side. Those represent about six gigawatts of tidal stream capacity. Now, it's important to emphasize that's not the limit of what can be deployed. Those are just the areas in which you could get maximum premium value from the deployment. And therefore, they represent early deployment targets. And we would encourage people to do full scale uh, feasibility in those areas with a move to deploying those. So please do get in touch with me if you've got any more questions or would like any more information. We will be publishing later in the year. Uh, do let me know if you'd like to be notified when we do that. And I can take questions either now or later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. If we can bring everybody back on, we've just got a few few minutes. Um, I'm going to field some questions to to you all. Uh, Nick, I'll start start with you. There is a question around. Um, Oh, sorry, I've just lost it. About the protection and preservation of ecosystems and oceans when we talk about generating tidal energy using such kind of turbine blades. Do you want to, can you make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, um, there has been quite a lot of research done and uh, indeed more research is ongoing about looking at the impact of renewables on the ecosystems. Um, there are a number of schemes. In fact, this particular one actually has cameras um, mounted around it looking for uh, the presence of wildlife, um, both um, with, with cameras and also acoustically to study what actually is being done. Um, so far, all the indications are that it is not significantly harmful to the ecosystems at all uh, and can, be, can even be beneficial in some cases. Great. That's, Great. that's the, the short answer. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, there's another question here about do the speakers think the sector will be able to match the ambitions set out by the Commission within its accelerated repower EU programme, or are they creating a financial or technical bubble which will burst? So we can maybe go around. Mark, do you want to comment on that? Yes, uh, yeah, no, took some time to unmute. Um, I, I think it is good to have the energy around the topic and to have uh, uh, targets that are ambitious so that the importance uh, is, is felt and seen uh, uh, around the entire uh, uh, European uh, community. Um, if everything is possible, I don't know, but I, I, I do uh, yeah, feel and see uh, the urgency that, that, that is now created, and I think that's positive. Um, um, these, these projects have a very, very long gestation period, um, and we will we, we really only see the effects in yeah, five to ten years' time, but if we don't start now, um, it will never happen, and I don't think it it will it will it will be, be difficult. It will be a challenge, but it won't. Uh, yeah, I think it's positive. Yeah. yeah, John, do you have anything to add to that? I I must admit that I haven't been keeping up to date very much um, due to project um, pressures over the past um, let's just say a month or two, but I would agree at a high level with what Marcus said. 
And um, I, I suppose th there is a level of concern that, um, you know, the world has moved on significantly in the past four to five months. Um, and I, I don't think that the EU legislation, whether you look at this Repower EU or if you look at um, the EU Delegated Act, that really they've kept pace with what's going on around us. And un unless, if we look at, for example, yesterday, diesel prices, two euros 20 at a fitting station, um, you know, steel prices, everything, you know, the, the, I suppose, the impending recession in Europe and so on, we need to, I think, um, really, um, I suppose, put supports and enabling um, legislation in place to allow things to accelerate for the next while. Because as, as Mark said, you can't turn on the hydrogen tap and expect to have it a supply in six months time. These large infrastructure projects, as we have seen with onshore wind, with offshore wind, it, it takes time. And I don't believe from what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that we're set up for success with uh, some of these recent uh, developments, Repower EU, EU Delegated Acts and so on. Yeah, and, and kind of leading on from that, there's, there's a question here about, which is related to that point, um, how robust is the hydrogen component supply chain today? What actions can be taken by governments to improve it if required? I mean, it seems to be that the supply chain is quite uh, vulnerable. Yeah, I, I, we are very concerned about that particular point, Diana. And, and the reason is that if we look again in Europe, we're controlled by, you know, regulated tender and so on, which means, you know, you can spend a year going to tender. Um, the lead time on electrolyzers that we're hearing from most suppliers today is circa 18 months. So if we start to just even take those two components, forget about grid, forget about, you know, regular supports, um, we're hamstrung and these projects that should be delivered with immediate urgency um, will be multi-year projects. And, and, and there are solutions, there are ways to get around um, these problems, but we really need, I suppose, to take um, an EU-wide or a European-wide approach to these and not let, um, I suppose, um, somewhat maybe um, dated, let's just say, legislation dictate what we need to do in what I classify as an emergency situation. Yeah, so, Stefan, do you want to just comment lastly on, on that same point about supply chains and how, how LHM views that? Yeah, it's uh, the, the the point raised is uh, is quite correct. When you you look at the the current supply chains, we see that delivery time for electrolyzers are getting longer. Uh, all components are getting uh, harder to get. Uh, so it's it's true uh, that uh, we we have to to do with what the market is right now. Um, so it's uh, all the the projects uh, are, are getting longer, but uh, it's. Uh, it, clients are able to understand. Uh, we're not the only one, uh, so it's uh, this is the good thing. But that's that's why we like also to make sure before going for the big projects, going uh, on everything. We prefer to learn uh, to walk before running, um, and uh, because the supply chain, everything is not necessarily proven to. Uh, and so I, I bounce on the report EU, uh, which is good. But uh, the ambition is quite high, uh, and we are not here yet. Um, so it's uh, all this goes together. Uh, in yeah, right. Absolutely. So we are over time. There's, there's a lot of questions that we haven't um, had the chance to go through, but we'll collate them and um, we will uh, provide responses, written responses to the audience. So that will follow. Um, just to say uh, thanks a huge amount to the speakers. It's been really interesting. It's been a, a, a great presentation. And thank you to the audience for um, spending the time with us this morning. So that's it from us. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.